what is this lesson about? It's about a little bit more about sharing, good practices when sharing code and data. The focus is on uh, understanding that whenever we develop change code, we almost always create derivative work. And when we do that, we need to understand software licensing. It matters because it matters the moment you want to share your code and we we have to share our code more and more. This is more than collaborative coding. This is social coding, maybe yeah. analogy to social media and uh, how do we reuse uh, people's materials? Yeah, because it's we are not working in isolation. I mean, we use other people's code. We um, and other people hopefully use our code. And I think a good starting point is if one thing I will do is I will copy paste. We have four questions for everybody. And I will copy this. So we have polls and questions. I will first copy them to the collaborative document. Now they are there. And this way you all write the presentation for us. Mm -hmm. oh, and the first question is, why would I even want to share my scripts code data? So there are some possible answers here and you can vote by adding a, a little O. Little O. Yep. Tiny lowercase O and then we get these. So here we got so many people like to share because it's easier to find and reproduce. Second question, what are, what are the things that concern you about sharing software? Yeah, I guess that depends on, on your point of view. If you are part of a company, maybe they might have a competitive advantage when they have their code maybe not shared, but so yeah. nice to see how the votes go. Yeah. yeah, I don't want to bias too much, but I I think many people relate to this one. Yeah. It's, it's ugly, it's unfinished, it's never finished, and it's never as beautiful as it could be. You know, one more week and then I will share. Oh. So this, then question three, so it, Software seems to be treated differently than papers. Uh, papers get citations. They give us track record. They matter to hiring committees. With software, it's often different. Why is it so? And question four, and it's about reusing other people's projects. Like when you, when you look, find a repository, on GitHub or somewhere, and you are thinking, ah, oh, interesting. Should I start my work based on this? Should I work? Should I look somewhere else? Should I write it myself? What are the things that you look at when deciding whether you want to reuse this project or not? Why do, do I, I get the vibe that this somehow might connect to also this reproducibility thing that we've been talking about? Yeah. Yes. And thanks a lot for all these answers. So this is super interesting. Yeah, definitely. And maybe the whole part of the first session of this can be really these answers. So let's see here. It's about why sharing. It's easier to find, easier to access, easier to reproduce. It's also about trustworthiness, because if I can see it, I can verify it. Uh, if if we if nobody can find it, nobody can build on top of it. So reuse. There is, it's possible that somebody will send a feature in request or an improvement. And here we, same for our lessons. If you see mistakes, we are now of course hoping that we get we get some improvements because now we know how. Uh, what happened to the other answers? It can also be, 
you know, I can I can display it on my CV. Or it can be that the journal asked me to. This is a great point. We often don't have the choice. Yeah. And journal expects it. Or I think there is now an expectation for data to be published together with the papers. But I think soon it will also become standard for software. And some journals do that already. So I might not even have the choice. So we better do it. Uh, but then we can ask ourselves not why, but how. And the how in a, in a little moment. What are the things that are concerning? Uh, yeah, maybe I made it a little bit biased, but this is this <laughs> answer of always wins the, the workshop. Yeah. Maybe it's like the principle of uh, or a notion of uh, uh, sharing unfinished today is better than sharing the perfect tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, this yeah. is me, but mm. maybe it was Enrico or someone who mentioned that previously. Yeah. And we are often so very self critical about our own work, but then much less critical about other people's work. Yeah, and and already sharing something that is because this is something that you are using. This is something that is being used. So, so test the code. Let's share it. What what else here? It is too early. I'm just prototyping. Yeah, the risk is that the that the the real finished one will never be published. But of course, I understand the sentiment here. And Sounds what can like be done? Sorry. Sounds like me. Just prototyping. Yeah, always but, prototyping. But what, what what I can do is that well, I can still put it on GitHub, and um, I can in the readme I can communicate this expectation. I can write that well, this code is not finished. It's not beautiful, but that's what I'm using. It will probably change completely. So communicating expectations, but at least it's there. Yeah, you Licensing. can mm -hmm. you can get past many many of these. Uh, self-critic issues if you just communicate them so it, yeah. then it's okay exactly and um, how about here what is why is it differently treated yeah it's we are often judged by senior people who were judged by other means it there is a question of like credit academic credit whether it counts or not um, is it peer reviewed or not? For me, it really boils down to can I put it on my CV or not? Will it matter or not? It's, it's often regarded as a tool, not as, um, as a valid scientific output, but I think this is how it should be regarded. What are the things that you look at when you discover a project and you're considering whether you should start based on that or not? Oh, this is a great point. Maybe we will come back to that when we talk about licensing. Quality requirements. Yeah, are they even documented? Does it look like it will be hard to install? What are the languages? Is this a language I understand or not? Is there a license? Great point. Because if there is no license, as we will see, then we have a bit of a problem. Because then it's not clear whether we can do anything with it. Yeah. Is there documentation? Is is the data and code in there? When was it updated last? Was it updated last in 2005? It can still be useful, but it will probably be a little bit painful to get it get it to work. So about activity. Uh, the other side of this coin of this activity and last update is that uh, when we publish something on GitHub Zenodo or GitLab, it's again about communicating expectations. We cannot be we cannot be expected to maintain and evolve all the codes we put there for the rest of our lifetimes. Yeah. So I think we have, I think participants here have solved uh, almost everything. 
I wanted to mention in the first episode of this lesson. I think I would like to move on to the second episode, which is about licenses and derivative work and copyright, and come back to some of the things that have been pointed out. Do you agree, Matthias? Anything else we should mention about the social coding part and sharing before we go into the like technical advice and legal and the legal questions? Yeah, I think we're we're good here, and uh, it's a kind of the main point of this lesson, the licensing part. Yeah, so that's the core. Hopefully, we also have some time talking about software citation, but this is about. This is really about licenses and it matters to all of us. Mm -hmm. And it's actually not, I find it's not a boring topic. It's a very important topic. And this is software licenses, they connect to copyright and copyright protects creative expression. And when we write scripts and software, we, it's creative work. So we, we are creators. So whatever we do there is covered by the copyright automatically, practically forever, uh, because it's lifetime and many, many years, and just try to reproduce anything I write for 70 years after I'm not here anymore, it will not be easy. But it's, it will still be copyright, whoever the owner is. And the, the central concept in in software licenses is derivative work. And here I did some derivative work and some sampling. I had some fun with generative AI uh, images. But what the point I wanted to make is that when we, when we write code, we are often sampling other people's code. We take something, we combine them, we modify. I, it's not that we always start from scratch. We often start from some something already existing. It can be the code of the previous student. It can be code from my previous job. It can be two different codes, and then I sample them, and I create a new mix, new mixtape. And in music, but also in code, you can do basically anything you like at home if you don't distribute it. So at home, I can take any any vinyl and I can make a sample mix and if I keep it at home nobody will know but with software and with research software we don't have the choice because we can't keep it at home because we we are more and more expected to publish software so I have to be very careful about what am I remixing because three years later I will have to publish it mm -hmm. And it's anyway a good idea to, to publish the code because it can be a good insurance for myself so that I can use the code in my next job. So in practice, uh, people need to pay attention to what they are copying into their work or their code already when they do it, not, not thinking that, okay, I don't have to publish this yet. I can do it whatever I want. Exactly. It's so important then to, we have to be careful about <clears throat> what we remix. Yeah. And I see the questions on the collaborative document. So what if we found a script somewhere on the internet can, and it doesn't have a license, what should we do? We will come back to that. So we have a practical recommendation for that. But let's have a little exercise and the exercise we will again do together on a collaborative document and let's not let's not look at the solution quite yet so which of these situations and i will put it under question 92 which of these situations is derivative work and which isn't and this is an important question because whether we then we need to look at licenses because the licenses will tell us what we can do with the derivative work. Can we share it not? And how do we how how do we need to share it? So which of these do you think is derivative work? If I download code from some website and I modify it, what if I completely 
I, I get a call from somewhere, but I change everything. Even I change, I write it to a different programming language. Is this derivative go work? How about linking to libraries, plugins? What if you read a paper and there is an algorithm and you program the algorithm? Is that the earthy fork? Yeah. Let's see what we let's see what the votes are. Where are they? Here they are. I would like to uh, uh, elaborate a little bit on on the copyright and and this creative expression part mm -hmm. uh, that you mentioned in the in the beginning. So as it tells copyright protects creative expression so that can be interpreted in for example code that if you have some very basic thing that you are doing import matplotlib as a plt and that sort of things and uh, or uh, print something or not yet create so much creative and also also um it might not be the, as, as far as I'm concerned, it might not be the actual text, the, the, the code mm. that you're writing. Instead, what the code does, what's the idea there that the um, copyright protects? Or is it just the other way around? What do you, what do you say? Yeah, so there are some, several things you, you mentioned. One is that, uh, linking to libraries, like if I do import matplotlib, that's mm -hmm. part of, it's like a library plugin driver. So if I link to them, use them without modifying them, that's actually not derivative work. So just because I did an import matplotlib, I didn't create a derivative work of matplotlib. Mm -hmm. um, but as you said, it's also about the size of my creation. If I write print hello world it's not some it, it doesn't have sufficient size to be copyrightable because then i, I cannot just sue the entire internet that they <laughs> for copyright infringements for or print hello world just because i wrote it so it has to have sufficient size of course it depends but but in practice i would say that any script or code that we write that is more than i don't know five lines how to say it it is copyrightable and we should, but we also, we shouldn't now be too worried about, there won't be any uh, court cases and we will probably never, no lawyer will contact us. It's more about making it easier for the next person. And the next person maybe looks at the license. So just make it easier for them to, to change it, reuse it, modify it. The next person might be you in future. And, and also there was something else in your question that it was about if it's about the algorithm. So the algorithm itself, we cannot copyright. So writing an algorithm in, in a paper or using an algorithm from a paper uh, here. So that is not derivative work because the algorithm is not copyrighted. So oh. yeah, like making the difference between the actual text and the idea behind uh, idea. Yes. So which one of those is is copyrighted? Can you steal an idea, or can so, you steal the the actual text? It's the expression of it. So it's the expression of the idea, not the idea itself. Yeah. However, if you see this answer, this is this question is I think interesting. If I find a code and I and the code is in in R, and mm -hmm. I rewrite it to Python. It has nobody will recognize a single line that has the same between new code and old code. It can still be derivative code because yeah. I have used the old code to test, to understand, to verify. There was an evolution. It always depends. Yeah, but this is what we do most of the time. I think this is what we want other people to do with our code. Um, so back to licenses, what does it really mean now? And now I want to show, spend a few minutes here on the overview so that we get an overview. Our goal is not that we become experts. We don't have to remember all the licenses, but that we 
that we can navigate this because we cannot choose here the license for you, but you will have to choose a license or maybe your university chooses a license. And we wanted you to be, to see where do these licenses, where you can find them on this, on this overview. This overview here comes from the European Commission. I like this overview. Let me, let me navigate you through it. On the right hand side, there are these different licenses. You have maybe heard about the GNU public license, MIT license, BSD, Mozilla public license. There is also an European Union public license. There are also data licenses, Creative Commons Zero, Creating Commons By, and they are sorted in, in different categories. So there is the permissive category and then the, the copyleft, the weak copyleft, the strong copyleft. So which one are like more open source? How does the scale go? So the scale, this, maybe the most popular license on the internet is maybe MIT because it's the simplest one. It's the most permissive one. Okay. It's the most open one in the terms of you can do anything with it that you want, mm -hmm. except you cannot remove the information where it came from. So you need to keep this is this was I have reused this. This was copyright. Matthias Eskalainen uh, from, and I got it from the center's place. Yeah. And so what do, so then we have this open source world. So these are the green, green one and the proprietary world. Proprietary licenses are, could be commercial, could be also code without the license. It's by default, we can't, we don't know what we can do with it, it's proprietary. So if I find a code on GitHub, it doesn't have any license. By default, I think of it as in the red category. Yeah. And what are these arrows? These arrows are compatibility. So I can, I can take a code that is permissive and the permissiveness means that it's, it's no problem to combine, uh, to take an MIT BSD license code, change it, and put it into my proprietary code that I never share with anybody. It's possible. Yeah. But the arrow goes this way. It doesn't go the other way. Uh, and this is also what the weak copyleft licenses do. It's possible to combine them. So it is possible to combine a weak copyleft license code with proprietary code under certain restrictions. And the weak here means that if they make changes to the open source code, they have to release the changes. They have to share the changes back, but they don't have to share the rest of the code. And then there is compatibility between these two dif between these uh, different uh, categories. So some observations here. Oh, and I see that we will soon take a break, but let me first summarize what we see here. So these arrows represent compatibility. And if you are unsure what so the one that is least restrictive is, I will take maybe MIT or Apache. Then if you are really interested in, if you want to make sure that the changes to your code are also shared openly, then you go into more increasingly copyleft licenses. If, if the code is proprietary, doesn't have any license, derivative work is not possible but we want derivative work in, in open science. And then I also wanted to contrast it a little bit with data licenses. So in data licenses, you have heard of Creative Commons licenses maybe. There we also have categories like non-derivative or non-commercial. But this doesn't really exist in the software license world because non-derivative doesn't make much sense for software because we want to change the software. Otherwise, why would we want to reuse it? And you also cannot, there is not really a non-commercial license type, but you can discourage commercial use by maybe making it more, more and more copyleft. 
which however also doesn't mean that you cannot make any money with copyleft licenses. I wanted to sh show you one amazing resource that that uh, we really like, and that is from the European Commission. They make made a really nice page here. This join up licensing assistant. That when you choose license for your code, it lists all the popular licenses. Let's go to maybe I mentioned BSD. Sorry, where is BSD? Yeah, BSD three clause. What I like about this, it very clearly lists what you can do, what you must do, what you cannot do. Also, it has it has a short commented summary for humans. So this is not not in very lengthy legal speak. It's for it's for code developers. The other thing that I like about this this one that you can compare licenses. So if if somebody asks me, well, I heard about BSD3 and I heard about Apache, what is the really the difference between the two? Let's compare them. Let's compare the two. And it will nicely summarize what you can do. So that we can already see that the difference between the two is it's about patents. What you must do, what you cannot do, the compatibility with other licenses and how, where it is anchored in US law, European law, what kind of support you can expect from when you choose this, this license. Yeah, this looks really nice. Should we take a break before we move on? And then we can then we still we will still have 20 more minutes where we can talk more about licenses. And then I would like to talk about the practical side of it. So what, what do we need to really do? But let's yeah. do that after the break. I recommend 10 minute break, which would which would so we will meet again eight minutes past the hour and we will continue about licensing. So see you eight minutes past the hour. Uh, stretch your legs, have a good time and see you in a bit, bye. Welcome back um, everybody. We have circa 20 minutes left today. We will discuss more about licenses, ownership, an important question when uh, because those who own the code can decide about license. So we need to also ask ourselves who is the owner. Uh, and we will um, also discuss code citation in a moment. Before going there, we wanted to pick up a few questions that came in. And thanks so much for the many really good questions. Oh, one question that we wanted to raise here is Question 91, I wrote a script uh, and of course all I know, I know from other people from the internet. So we, we, we piece together the script from pieces of code on Stack Overflow, maybe some GitHub page. Yeah, that's like most of the coding nowadays. Yeah. So how can we can we just license it? Can I decide that this is MIT license? How does it work in practice? Um, and of course it depends always, but if, that's why it's so good to, at least from now on, we will know that when whenever I take something that is more than one line, that is non-trivial, I will, I will look at what are the license terms. If this is Stack Overflow, uh, you can reuse it. Now I, for I forgot whether this is uh, typically MIT or BSD. We say it somewhere in the in the material. But if if this comes from Stack Overflow, what I like to do is when I copy paste the code example and adopt it, then I I put a link in there. I took the I took this from this Stack Overflow page and I modified it. So the credit goes to, to that person. Um, 
otherwise of course depends but i can't really go into proprietary code and copy paste out a small function out of it that's already that can be a little bit too much maybe a related question is now with with ChatGPT, copilot how does it work there what if how does that work if if i take an answer from ChatGPT, put it into my code it works uh, can i license it what are the license terms there maybe one like, like a guideline in general would be that if in doubt check the terms of use of that uh, specific service that you've been using yeah, and with oh uh, yeah, what we can show that as an example maybe so with of course with the AI, it's a new territory. Yeah, and I don't really have a clear recommendation. It it can get legally a bit murky. Mm -hmm. Universities are now adapting to the situation. Many lawyers are busy working out new guidelines because the question there is what was the training set yeah uh, under which license was the training set um, and some companies are not very transparent about that if the training set was let's imagine that the training set it was all mit and bsd code on github but how then about the attribution so does does the copilot or ChatGPT now attribute so how does that work and this, all this needs to be worked out. And what we can expect is that there will be, there, there will be interesting court cases to follow about uh, when working out the guidelines. Yeah, and also like the what the chat GPT produces for the generative AI in general. It's uh, it's not. Uh, I mean, the question might be: Is it derivative or or not? So like it's not producing you the same uh, things that it has in the training set. Instead, it's producing some similar things that there is a training set. So, I mean, the results are not exactly the things that it finds in the training set. They are similar to those. So I guess there might be some boundary where we consider it not any more derivative work or I'm not sure. Also, from Stack Overflow, I would say, uh, again, if there's a like basic one-liner that that's basically the one way of doing something, it, it I, I would say it's not. Uh, indigenous work it, it, it's not the, someone's idea but it's the general thing that everyone uses so it, i mean mm -hmm. so that you have the copyright i think you have to have such work that only you are able to produce so if you change the person producing would they end up in with same results if they would end up with same results then it's not like a, then it's like a general thing and it's more like a i don't know yeah. i would say then it's not copyrighted hmm. so many many interesting questions come come up now with the that we move in the into the ar world can we can we copyright prompts how about how about the models how about the training sets further down on the licensing page we have a we have at least some 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 references and here, what I wanted to show is how I would do a Stack Overflow post, but I have microphone off, but now I have it on. So I would refer to this link. And here we also see a recommendation. I mean, this is these are the license terms. I have to attribute the origin and I have to share my changes to it, share alike. You have also, Matthias, you have raised an important point about ownership and copyright so who actually has the copyright 
who, who has the ownership. It depends if you, depends where you work, which country. We have put in here a couple of guidelines that we know about from different universities. It would be nice to have more resources yeah. listed. Um, the two of these that are particularly, that are very clear and very practical that I really like is the one from, from Alto University. So have a look. Also very clear recommendation from NTNU that actually recommends a specific license unless overriding guidelines exist. The other resources here, so University of Tromsø, University of Bergen, University of Oslo, so these are all Norwegian universities are less explicit about software uh, ownership and software licensing choice. But now that we have 50 minutes left, let's let's be practical here. Mm -hmm. What what do we need to do? So we don't have to be worried. Uh, but what should we do? One thing we have hopefully conveyed is that we cannot ignore it. Uh, it's also not a good idea to postpone it. Because at the beginning of a project, there is it's very easy. There is not much there. Not too many people. It's it's easy to change it. Twenty years later, twenty people later, it's more difficult to to change things. So, license the code very early in the project. We cannot ignore it. Ideally, from day one, I like to start my projects by adding a readme file and a license file. I use this tool. There is not the one perfect license for everybody. Uh, you, I think you, but go for an open license, go for a standard license. Um, if maybe permissive is the one you want, unless guaranteeing that you see um, changes published, which you can in turn reuse, then go for a share alike. Something like the EU public license. There is a, this reuse software has a really useful checklist on what to make sure, what are the few things that you should have in your project so that the license reuse becomes easier for other people. Uh, JOS, so the Journal of Open Source Software, is has a very nice checklist on what are good things to have in your readme. Not only about license, but also about license. So I recommend having a look at those. It goes beyond licenses. It's also about how, how you want people to contribute, code of conduct. These are also really useful things to have. The, the one practical recommendation that is bold faced here, do not design your own license. Take one of the existing ones because then the compatibility is scrolling up here. Then it's clear whether they are compatible or not. If I design my own, then it will be unclear. Yeah, it's also uh, why not why to reinvent the wheel. And yeah, choose your uh, li choose license that fits your uh, use case. And this is a great advice that Enrico also mentioned earlier today at, at the start. Is that even if even if the repository is private and we didn't publish anything yet, and it, it's all just on my computer. It's useful to prepare for the, for the time that one day it will become public. One day I will have to publish it. So let's already think about things that I put into Git history. Is there mm -hmm. anything that shouldn't be in there? Because I don't want to then spend time removing it from the history in, in a couple of years. So work as if the repo was public even if it is still private. Yeah, that also helps. Uh, maybe you don't write that ugly code if, if you think that it's going to be public anyway, so then you don't have to clean it up so much. Precise. Uh, we have a couple of reference resources for data sets and databases, but this is here our focus was software, but still we list a couple of those. Also some resources on licensing machine learning and AI. I'm not an expert in this. Uh, I would love to learn from you if 
if uh, you all have more experience, some resources that we can link to. Because now we need to think not about, it's not only about software or data. How about the model? Is the model data? Is the model software? How about the training set, the training data and the production data? The AI evolutions, how are they versioned? How are they released under which license? So here are some resources. We have a lot more resources down here. So if you are interested in reading more, there is a lot listed here. Yeah, um, let's say someone has uh, more information on this, for example, this AI, you know, whatever uh, changes, proposals to our uh, lessons, then uh, maybe you can show where the link is to, to the source code. And if you don't want to, make a pull request, you can always open an issue just to discuss the thing. And uh, can you show where to find that? Uh... Great advice. So on any of our lessons, if you scroll up, so now I'll scroll all the way to the top, edit on GitHub, let's go. Then you land in the lesson page. And here you can, I mean, you just send us a pull request with a change or open an issue. Here, new issue on page two, there is a problem. And, and then we know, and then we can improve it. So this will also help a lot, not only for this lesson. Yeah, and issues can have comments, so there can be actual discussion around the topic for for some time. Yeah, and let's, let's have a stress test. Does our lesson even have a license? Let's see. <laughs> now is the moment to be embarrassed. Ah, we have a license. Nice. And it's what is the license it's uh, github actually sees that there is a license file and it so all our lesson material is creative commons with attribution and now seven minutes left but it's still enough time to to talk about software citation i will go to the final episode of today's lesson mm -hmm. um, we have seen this in the previous lesson. Putting something on GitHub GitLab is really nice, but it's not publishing. It's not enough. But we have we have um, demonstrated the Zenodo service. There are other services. Um, what about papers? What if you want to publish a paper that is focusing on scientific software? So the focus is maybe not the how it is used, but the focus is on the software itself. And there are a number of papers that specialize on this. And this blog post that is linked from here provides a, re, um, um, a nice list and summary of papers with this focus. And um, if you want to make your software citable, uh, here is a checklist for Item number one, appropriate license, but also connecting to our previous lesson, um, not only in human readable format, in metadata format, clear version numbers, but also crediting the authors, having a persistent identifier, and add a recommended citation. And practical recommendations again, Get a DOI um, for your code um, in a similar way that you get the uh, digital object identifier for data, and then they can cross-reference each other. Um, take a standard license. And then we mentioned this metadata, um, a nice way of adding citation metadata to your project is is a citation file format, which has been developed and now, now is around for a couple of years. Also, GitHub supports this. And here's an example for such a file. So you can add this to your repository. This should go with the repository. And then uh, with a recommended citation. Um, and then <clears throat> uh, this becomes also really useful for machines, not only for humans, that collect metadata about how projects cite and reuse each other. 
and how, how should we cite other people's software, here are great resources. And the summary of this is that uh, these, this should be the minimum information that we should be included in when citing other people's code. Again, there is the version. Um, the, the particular format depends, and um, that's why it's also nice if um, if we if you provide if if they provide a recommended citation. My experience is that if if your code has a recommended citation in your README, people will follow that. If it's easy to find, easy to copy paste, it will be followed. People want to cite. It's just if it gets hard, if it takes a lot of research to uh, to collect this information, then maybe it will be skipped. We have, please, please keep the questions coming still. We have at the, since we are not too many minutes left from the end of, of today, we have feedback form. What uh, about the speed for today? What was good about today? What was it that, that was not so good? What, what should we change, improve, remove? And, and any other feedback. So this is something we really want to hear. We use this information. Things that we, we can change already this week, we will change already this week. There's one, uh, one comment mentioning, maybe if I understand, would I wanted to learn more about the containers and dockers? Maybe, of course, the episode uh, and the lesson material is there, but um, maybe we could try to link uh, more material. Yeah, we should be, because there are other existing lessons in a similar style. So in the software carpentry world, uh, there are lessons about singularity, obtainer. Um, we have a couple of lessons in our um, in the places where we work, mm -hmm. and it would be good if we collect them so that so that people have starting points. Not sure if it's helpful, but what helped me with containers is that at some point I started using them just for my own work on my own computer, which at the beginning it takes a lot of time, but then once once it's working, then suddenly the container becomes very mobile, and I can then then I can go to a different com computer, and then I can go to a different cluster. But I like for a few days I forced myself to install new new software through a container until I got used to it. Yeah. Thanks for the feedback also about more hands-on. It is, today we had only two sessions and this is also because the software licensing part is difficult to do hands-on in as individuals. But tomorrow and Thursday we are back to hands-on exercises. So tomorrow we will have, to my information, we have three or four exercise sessions in two in each, in each lesson. So today was a little bit discussy uh, day, but tomorrow back to more exercises. Also compared to last years, we have increased the exercise lengths. Hopefully this has helped to create an environment where people could also ask questions if you were in the same room. Yeah, more MATLAB examples would be really nice. And here you can see also our, our bias, we are, we have this implicit bias. There is a lot of Python stuff because this is where we come from. I'm now learning R. We want to have more R examples in the lesson material. It would be nice to have more MATLAB, more Julia, so that everybody can choose their, their track. What can people expect for tomorrow and Thursday. Tomorrow is uh, documentation. We will talk about good practices for documenting code. 
also tools, but not only tools, also like what to document, what not to document, where to document. Um, we have a session about notebooks, which is a nice, it's a nice idea to collect um, code and human readable description and plots all in one place. Mm -hmm. We will show how to share these in a, in a really reusable, well, we will show how to share it in a way that makes it really easy for other people to rerun it. So that's for tomorrow and on Thursday, we talk about testing. Mm -hmm. And we will then wrap up the workshop by discussing modular code development, how to structure a project as the project grows, yeah. how to keep it nice, modular, yeah. and understandable. That, that last one's a really nice interactive example. We basically see the project start as a tiny few lines in Jupyter and exactly how most of us would do as it grows and becomes a package and something shareable and citable, modular, scriptable, all that. Yeah, and I hope people stay until the end because it's fun, fun lesson. Then mm -hmm. it's kind of an improv where you can all influence it. Uh, so that's the plan for the next two days. Yeah. So already tomorrow, uh, we're gonna need the code finery conda environment, right? Yeah. Right. Tomorrow we need it. Yeah, yeah. There were some problems about activating the environment and using the. Python code for the snake make example. Um, if you see this problem, I'd recommend talking to someone local to fix this because we will keep using it the next days. And it's really hard for us to debug here, but if someone can look at your screen, they can probably figure it out much faster. Yeah, it's true, yeah, yeah. So, um, and th there are many more. So the next three lessons, everything tomorrow and the first one Thursday is very hands-on and plenty of work to do. So get your teams together. Okay, well, um, Let's see. Yeah. Before we close, big thanks to everybody for staying. Lots of questions. Uh, big thanks to also those not visible here on stream who, who help us answering these questions. So there are many people really busy typing. <laughs> we'll have to do yeah, some stretching exercises after three and a half hours of. Yeah. So, so help. thanks so much for all the help and thanks to all the team leads. So, yeah, I mean, you see us, but you don't really appreciate how many people are here. So it looks like we've made close to uh, 80 kilobytes of text with questions and answers, which is just an amazing amount of talking and help from these people. Okay. Um. Yes. Yeah. Are we good to go then? I think we're good to go. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank studio, you. Richard. Thanks to Matthias. That was it was great to go through this together. Yeah, thank you. It was nice. Okay. Then I will or we will see you tomorrow. Yeah. See you. Okay. Bye. Bye.